very much. Good afternoon. Well, I mean, common systems, open data, they're clearly good things, something we will sort of sign up to, but they're actually harder to, to do in practice. So uh, I've just got a, a short presentation, we've got about a 20 minute slot. So I'd like to talk through four of our projects I've been working on to try and deliver some of these. So before I start off, I'll just talk a little bit about openness and, and what we understand by it and what we use what we have been doing in, in the GLA. So if you go back even six years or so, I think that the GLA's engagement with, with the open source and open data community was, was pretty limited, to be honest. Um, we um, got a Drupal website, but, but a, a lot of our other systems are very kind of traditional, very kind of vendor-led. But there's been a huge step change in the last five, six years. And I can see a couple of my colleagues from the technology group in the audience, and they, they've led some of that. Um, but it's definitely been led by our experience of working with external organisations from, from the open source world um, and just from um, officers demanding kind of to work differently and to, to um, be able to be, be more open. So one of the most public first, um, manifestations of that is the London Data Store. So um, I'm going to talk a bit more about that, but that's our open data platform and it's where we publish data. Um, but as you can see from the second bullet point, clearly there's been a huge change in the way that central governments publish data over the last few years and we benefit from that on a daily basis. We make use of, of all these kind of great date, national data sets that, that are now available. Thinking more about the software, um, we've got Linux servers. We have just closed down, I think, our last project using um, um, a traditional corporate database and moved across to Postgres, uh, which, is, which is working brilliantly. Um, we're using CCAN and WordPress uh, for our um, data store. And traditionally, our analysts would have used Excel or maybe SPSS to, to do a lot of their analysts. Um, they're now doing it in R, which has got a fantastic community, um, developing lots of really powerful tools. Um, Python where, when links very well with RGIS and for web scraping. And then when we're starting to get into the world of, of really big data sets, uh, we're starting to use technologies from that community like Clojure and some of the Apache stack. And that's us benefiting from it. But I think one of the principles behind open source is that exchange um, of, of knowledge and, and experience. And we're also starting to actually come contribute back. So some of our uh, models are, are up on GitHub. Uh, we commissioned a project called My London, and that's all been made open source. Um, and we benefited from some of the national data store work, so data.gov.uk, when we came to do the London data store. But then our work has been used by Leeds and then Amsterdam. And some of the work commissioned by Leeds has then benefited us because that was um, allows us to um, deliver pages that are more responsive, work better on tablets and phones. So it, it, you've got this kind of circle of, of, great, of um, improvement and, and benefiting from, from each other. And then finally, the um, city modeling platform we're going to talk about, um, working with a company called Mastodon C, and they've benefited from open source software as their starting point. But all the work they're going to do with us um, then gets published back on GitHub and is available for other, other cities to benefit from. So the, the London Data Store launched in 2010, and one of the drivers behind it actually was the transparency agenda. So if you think back to the headlines back in 2010, there were lots of um, issues about MPs' expenses and um, Duck Islands and, and so on. And the mayor's response to that was to say, well, I, I want to run the GLA in as open a way as possible. Um, I want to be as, as transparent as I can be and publish things proactively, not work, not wait for freedom of information requests and, and journalists to probe us, but actually be proactive and put stuff out there. It, it also came at a time where our analysts were trying to move away from very traditional standard monthly reports to actually publishing the raw data and letting other people do their own analysis and draw their own conclusions rather than just um, being able to receive the, the official kind of party line on things. And it was quite limited to start with. It was just a, a relatively straightforward website. You could download stuff from it. It only had about 200 data sets, most of which were public um, data. But, but actually, a lot of those data sets weren't available anywhere else. And it did bring them all in, together into one place. And one of the really useful things it triggered was um, Transport for London releasing their real-time data. So if you've ever traveled on the buses or the tubes in London and looked up how long it is for the next bus or the next one, and there's all sorts of fantastic apps and obviously the real-time displays. Um, 
feed the same thing. So I know that's been a huge kind of breakthrough and it's made a huge difference, I think, to the way London is able to function and adapt uh, where if there are kind of issues on, on the transport network. And we, we get lots of visits from other cities coming to find out about open data and they're always really envious of, of the arrangement we've got with, with TfL in London and they're always kind of very impressed. So that's um, the starting point in 2010. By 2012, it became clear that there were lots of users who weren't your, your kind of hardcore data geeks that wanted to just have a high-level overview, that, that there were several hundred data sets by that point, and it was quite hard for people to pick their way through to understand really what was happening in London, to get an overview of kind of what things were improving, how things were doing against targets, what things were, were getting worse. And so we launched the dashboard. Um, to uh, pick out the kind of the nine kind of key set, they were linked to mayoral priorities, um, but you could drill down into the raw data as well. So that was the, the dashboard. By the time we got to 2014, we, we really had quite a long wish list of things we wanted to be able to do with the data store as, as users, and our user community want, had a, a wish list of stuff they, they wanted to be able to do. And in the meantime, obviously, you've got the, the nationaldata.gov UK had, had um, invested a, a lot of effort on um, customising CCAN and, and building that up. And what that enabled us to do was to move away from a, a GLA data store to being a, a London data store. So it allows us to set up publishers so organisations like the boroughs, like the Lee Valley Park, Olympic Park and so on can have their own area and upload data, upload with their own data without messing up everyone else's as data and, and really kind of transformed the, the way that the, the website works. Uh, it also made it much better for users, because by that time we had 1,600 tables of information, so there's a lot to search through. And we learned from some of the um, sort of consumer websites, uh, you know, whether it's kind of eBay or Amazon or whatever, um, there are great tools for searching, for filtering, refining stuff down, and, and we used some of those approaches to try and make it easier to, for people to find stuff. Because one of the things we find is that the people looking for data, for using the data, aren't necessarily the same people who publish it. So you might publish it, you might have a very specific discipline, you're trained to use specific language, and the person needing to answer the question may have come from a very different background, and so they may be using different words to find stuff. So that's quite a non-trivial task, and it's something we, we spent quite a lot of time uh, trying to improve on. Uh, in terms of the num raw number of users, we started off at relatively low level, so we had about 10,000 visitors a month. We're now up to about 70,000 visitors a month. So the, you can see the, um, the gold line running through the middle. It's quite noisy data. There's kind of quite a few spikes there. And we think a lot of that is to do with publishing specific data sets. So our um, economics team have quite a loyal band of followers, and whenever they publish something interesting, the site really gets hit. So that's a lot of those peaks and troughs are due to specific data releases. Um, but you can see the overall tend is, is upwards and you've got specific events so you've got the dashboard you've got the release the CCAN release and then you've got the, the open data awards last year gave us gives a big boost and then this year we've just launched the data strategy so we're, we're thinking that'll probably give it a boost again as well so that's the raw number of users but what type of people are, are using the open data well it's a completely open platform you don't have to sign on to use it which is great in one sense, um, but it means it's quite hard to actually understand who's benefiting from and, and, and who's using it. So we have a community of people who communicate with us regularly and aren't ask questions. Um, we've done some uh, opinion-based kind of research, but also we've got a, a group of about 5,000 organisations who are registered and they benefit because they're able to track data sets and see when there are updates um, and have extra functions over and above someone just visiting the site. And in from that group, we've, we've done this very sort of simple analysis here. So a lot of the users are London boroughs, as you'd expect. So they're working with their own data and they come to the London data store to see the context of what else, how, how is their work, how are their services uh, in, in context with, with the rest of London and, and their neighbours. Um, the other are uh, people were registered with their private addresses, but actually from our other research, I think a lot of those are, are researchers and academics, so the, the blue bit in the middle would probably be bigger than it, it really is there. Uh, it's great to see the voluntary sector using it. But what was really interesting was that purple bit at the top, the private companies. So the London Data Store is genuinely helping private companies um, deliver 
um, services and, and it's part of their business model. And in some cases, they might be app companies or, or web companies. But in lots of cases, they're um, consultants and analysts. So they might be advising developers or, or, or all sorts of other kind of specialists. And they have their own data sets doing their own analysis, but they're using data from the London Data Store as context and as part of their analytical kind of process. So it, it's, it's a genuine part of helping London's economy, which was not really foreseen right at the start, but, but is, is clearly um, something that's happened. So made improvements for people publishing data and, and being able to find data. Um, one of the other big changes was um, creating an, an API, so um, machine kind of to machine access of the data sets. And, and most data catalogues, most city data stores, you can go in and you can grab a list of data sets. That's quite a kind of common thing to be able to do. But what we managed to do with this project is allow people to look at into specific data sets and grab data back out. Um, and then bring it into a website or, or an app. So we, we did this in two parts. We did an API to, to make it ha available, but also we did a very simple front end just to illustrate what, what can be done with it. And clearly, we're, we're not app developers or, or website builders. Um, so we, we just did a very sort of simple one. And it's quite a big problem in London of people either moving into London for the first time or moving within London and not necessarily knowing where where's the best place, most suitable place for them to live. If you've grown up in, in West London, you may not know much about East London. If you live in South London, you may not know much about North London and, and so on. And there's lots of fantastic information on the data store. So as well as all the house price stuff, there's uh, crime, uh, information about schools, open spaces, public transport, but it's all in different tables. And what we want to do is get to a point where someone could click on a map, it goes into the data store, grabs the right information for that area, and brings it back in real time and, and presents stuff. So, so that's what we did. Um, and it allows people to choose what their priorities are, because uh, if you've got kids, you might be interested in the schools and the parks. If you haven't, um, and you haven't got a car, you might be interested in public transport. So it allows you to kind of filter and choose the things that are important to you. And then um, it presents the information back um, instantly. And we keep the tables behind it up to date so that you're getting the, the most kind of recent picture you can. So that's our kind of sort of work on open data. The, the other kind of next big piece of work has been on predictive modeling. So we've got some very bright people who, who I work alongside who look at population projections and look at economic models, look at what energy London's energies might be like in 30 years' time and all, all sorts of different modelling. And traditionally, they've, they've done stuff on Excel spreadsheets, which has been great for them because it gives them complete control over the models. But it, it does have limits. Um, it doesn't scale very well. It's quite hard to um, have good version control. And so we started looking around, and there are lots of custom solutions out there, but they're very much black boxes. So um, they're supplied by vendors, and you can put stuff into them, you get stuff out. But it's very hard to control the models and, and really kind of understand what's going on and really adapt it. So they didn't quite work for us. Then there's some really beautiful, visually engaging city models out there, kind of 3D fly-throughs and stuff that look fantastic. But again, for the, for the hardcore analysts, they, they didn't quite have the, the tools that we wanted. So we've been working uh, with a big data specialist, um, some funding from Innovate UK to build our own um, system that allows the modelers to create the models and to adapt them and to link together and to e explore them. But then it allows the policy makers um, to tweak some of the inputs because they don't want to get into the equations, they don't want to get into the nitty gritty. What they want to do is to try out different inputs and see well, what are the outputs. So you look at these different projections for population or jobs or transport, how does that affect your, your uh, energy demand and so on, and explore different scenarios. Um, in it, so you're working off the same data, the same models, but you have a different view of it. And then for the public, Really, they don't want to get into the equations either, but they want to be able to explore some of the kind of key outputs and understand what City Hall's considering doing to them over the, over the next 30 years in, in all sorts of different ways. So that, that's our, our solution. If, if you want to search it, Witten will come up and um, please, please do have a, a read. And the process of, of supporting this kind of modeling project 
made it really clear that um, our open data is quite well organised, um, there's lots of descriptive metadata, it's kept up to date, but actually our analytical data that we use on a day-to-day -day basis is, is kind of scattered over a number of different departments. So uh, an example might be um, we've got the National People Database, so 8 million records um, where every pupil lives, where they, where they go to school uh, for the last four or five years, and that's the level of detail of data that we need to be able to do our analysis to forecast um, where we need new schools, where, where schools are going to be under pressure. But clearly that's not open data, you can't put that out on, on the internet, but you need somewhere to share that, to, to store it and so on. So if the open data is, is the tip of the iceberg, then you've got this huge iceberg of, of kind of city data that's maybe got some um, privacy issues, maybe got some um, commercial data kind of uh, attached to it that you can't just put out on the internet, but, but you do need to share and you do need to, to look after. So we've got this ongoing project to create a city data store, so to create a, a private version of, of the open data store. Um, again, still using open data product, open source products. Um, and I, I mean, it started off as a project to organise our own data, but actually a lot of the really interesting, useful data in London is held by the boroughs, collected and held by the boroughs. A lot of the day-to-day -day services are delivered by the boroughs and other agencies, whether it's the police or the Olympic Park or whatever. So what we're now doing is trying to build that out into a, a hub-and-spoke system that allows boroughs to exchange data securely with one another um, and, and with us, but not necessarily with, through us, so that you might have a cluster of maybe four or five boroughs wanting to work together to solve a particular problem. This is a system that potentially allows them to um, export stuff out of their legacy systems and then exchange data in a, a secure area. And if, if open data is the tip of the iceberg and, and you've got the city data as the rest of the iceberg, you, you've got this tidal wave of data potentially coming in uh, from the Internet of Things, from lots of sensors. So lots of buildings over the next few years are going to be wired up full of sensors, cars, the streetscape with smart lampposts and parking bays and so on. Uh, people, obviously, um, with their phones and various other things. And we've got a, um, a project funded by Horizon 2020, European funding, to explore bringing together some of this siloed data uh, and solve some of the technical problems of uh, bringing it together but also harmonizing it and aggregating it so you can actually use it to make decisions and inform decision making. So you imagine if you've got a, a Boris bike rack, um, each of those individual racks is constantly spewing out, I'm full, I'm empty, I'm full, I'm, I'm empty. And you don't really want that level of detail. What you want to know is across a week or across a month, how are the bikes being used, where are they being used and so on. So you want, need to be able to aggregate it up and um, and then kind of use it to inform decision making and, and investment. I realise that it's a huge topic and, and 20 minutes isn't very much, so please do grab me in the um, session afterwards uh, or, the, or the tea break or, or email me. I'm, I'm very happy to discuss any of these in, in more detail. But um, we think we've made some progress in some areas, um, but we're very keen to learn from other cities who are, I know are doing all sorts of interesting things as well. Thank you. And I guess um, if I could just, just kick off with a question, and you mentioned that the whole open data movement really started with the transparency um, agenda and you know, things like the MPs um, scandal. I think that's probably true of, of many um, local authorities as well. But, and you mentioned that you've now got this shift into using data for predictive modelling. Mm -hmm. I guess I'm wondering what's been the experience of trying to take you know, uh, you know, either councillors or GLA members or policy makers with you on that journey, so from a mindset of transparency to actually now data can help you make definite decisions about what policies you might want to implement. Hmm. I think it really varies. Some of them definitely get it. So um, there have been lots of projects um, led from the environment team, for instance, where we've been looking at smart ger urban drainage and all sorts of green moves, all, all sorts of things. So I think that, that side of the GLA really kind of got it. Other sides, I think, probably haven't yet, but if we can provide a few case studies of, of the benefits, then I, I think that will definitely come. I, I mean, that's, that's the key for me, I think, is lots of people are talking about it, but it, it, it's quite hard to put some, fin well, financial benefits, but also social benefits on, on some of these things. And I think the more we're able to do that, then I think it then gets an easier sell to people who haven't come from a, a data-rich kind of background or a data-led analytics sort of background. 
thank you. Questions from the floor um, and all reflections on your own open data or data analytics experience. Yes, gentlemen at the front, if we can have a uh, name, organisation and a brief question. Um, so my name's Andrew Coote. Uh, I'm working for Soccer Tim at the moment and in areas around digital transformation. And Paul, one of the things that I've found, particularly when you're looking at social care and the NHS, is running into issues of information governance. Mm -hmm. So as a for instance, you know, the ability to be able to share an address where the NHS uh, data architects regard that as being personal information. Mm -hmm. So I just wonder, you know, what, what are your barriers to being able to push this out? And how particularly around information governance are you mm -hmm. trying to push this up the agenda to, to uh, um, get it aired as a serious issue. Yeah, yeah. That, I mean, that's a huge problem, especially as we start working more and more with the boroughs. I think I think there's two sides to it. One, there are genuine problems, and then there are perceived problems where I think there are a lot of officers who don't have clear guidance and are worried about being exposed or worried about doing the wrong thing and therefore do nothing. So one of the things we're intended to do is try and improve the amount of um, legal support behind some of these things so it doesn't take two or three years to kind of come up with an agreement for each data set that we've got some maybe standard agreements that you can use and, and adapt and you've got experienced um, lawyers with, with the right type of experience who can give a guarantee that um, on one side their data will be safe and, and will be used in the right way um, but on the other side make sure that artificial barriers aren't, aren't put up because I've definitely kind of experienced that. Um, but but um, I mean I know that the Office of Data Analytics in Manchester is sort of they're, they're looking at the technology, they're looking at the analysis, but they've also got a, a small team trying to sort out the legal problems as well between those sort of nine or ten boroughs. So they, they've recognised it, and then we we certainly have. Other questions from the floor? Yes, Jeff at the back. Thank you. Jeff Connell representing a couple of the London boroughs. Um, I wonder what data gaps you've got and what, what the London boroughs could help to do to fill some of those gaps. And I think going back to your earlier point about the, um, uh, the case studies of the benefits, I, I totally agree that's the key. People mm -hmm. need to understand what we can get out of this mm -hmm. uh, and then they'll put more effort into contributing to it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm the, the GLA doesn't deliver many frontline services, so most of the data gaps relate to the delivery of, of frontline services, so whether it's um, adult social care, um, whether it's ch um, troubled families, um, whether it's collecting waste. Um, I, I think a lot of the gaps relate to those, and obviously there's certain budgets you can see, looking at local authorities, they're the, going, they're the big budgets now, and they're predicted to grow, but it's quite hard to know. Um, how much they're going to grow and where they're going to grow. And, and, I th and it's very difficult for a, a borough to do that on its own because it needs to take into account its relationships with neighbours. So one, I guess one of the, the best examples we've got at the moment is the work we've been doing on schools' roles. And um, anyone who's got kids will know that um, it's very common, particularly at secondary school, for kids to live in one borough to go to school in another. It's very difficult for... We, we know that there's certain areas where there be maybe 30% more children in a few years' time, but it's not clear just to that borough alone where those children are coming from, where, where they'll go to. So on a London-wide level, we, we did some analysis and brought data together and um, worked with the boroughs on, on the specific questions that they had. And I think it would be great to reproduce that on some of these other kind of big challenges that the boroughs are are facing um, because they affect Londoners and they don't see the distinction, oh, oh that's the mayor's responsibility, that's the borough's responsibility, they just want it sorted. Uh, and I think it's up to us as public servants to, to try and work together and, and deliver that. Any other questions from the floor? If not, maybe if I just make a, a brief and cheeky uh, reference to some work that actually Nesta has been working with Paul Andrew Collins, many of you will know, um, at the GLA, and also hopefully in partnership with a number of London boroughs to get those case studies. We're going to launch a data 
pilot to show if you can pull data from multiple uh, public sector bodies, multiple local authorities, what can you do with it? Let's get those case studies, let's prove you can save money and my sincere hope is that way that will open up some central government funding um, who as we all know have, have not been forthcoming with their funds for, for local government digital transformation. Also running a similar project in the northeast to look at can we create the case for setting up offices of data analytics at a city scale. We'll keep you posted on that. But if anyone's interested, Paul's involved, I'm involved, Andrew, Colin, uh, Andrew Collins is involved, um, I'm very happy to share thoughts on that. But on that note, uh, we, it is time for our networking break, but just before that, please put your hands together uh, for our thanks for Paul. Thank you. Thank you.